Okay. Um, I guess I'm introducing myself today. Uh, my name is Howard Rush. I'm the uh, director of the Unit for Laboratory Animal Medicine, which is a uh, department in the medical school. Um, it's the academic home for all the veterinarians on campus, or most of the veterinarians on campus. Um, and uh, I've been asked to talk to you a little bit about animal research and how that functions at the university, what the laws and standards and guidelines are. Um, this is pretty open, so if you have any questions as I move along, please feel free to ask. And um, I'll give you some background information on how the laws evolved where we are right now. Um, I'll finish up with kind of the, the current state of affairs at uh, University of Michigan, how big our program is, and so on. Uh, okay. So, um, first of all, I'm going way back. Um, the interaction between animals and humans is really quite old. Obviously, we've been eating them for a long time. But beyond that, uh, as companions, we domesticated dogs about 15,000 years ago and cattle about 10,000 years ago. Uh, so we've had a, a close relationship with animals for a very long time. You can uh, categorize the types of animal use into a variety of categories. The most common categorization system is food. That's pretty obvious. Um, clothing. Uh, we use leather, uh, uh, wool, those sorts of, of products. Um, we don't have pets in the United States anymore. We have companions. Uh, we used, when I grew up, we had pets, but uh, now we have companions. Uh, we used to use animals for work quite a bit many years ago uh, before uh, modernization technology came along. Uh, we still use animals for work in a number of uh, specialized areas, particularly dogs now are used quite a bit in work. And we've all are familiar with uh, seeing eye dogs, hearing dogs, um, rescue dogs, uh, and a variety of bomb sniffing dogs and so on. Uh, entertainment, um, that was a big area for uh, animal use. For, if, for, it has been for a long time. Um, some people would like to go to horse races, zoos, uh, uh, a whole variety of areas where animals are utilized in an er entertainment. I grew up in the area of Flipper, or the er era of Flipper, uh, the dolphin. Uh, and so we have animal actors now quite extensively. And then, of course, research, and that's one of the reasons you're here. Um, is because of the use of animals in research, which has been going on for a fair amount of time, but is much, has become much more in, intensive since uh, the end of World War II. Okay, um, now attitudes towards animals. This is a categorization system that was developed a number of years ago. Um, and um, it's easiest to start kind of in the middle most of us are familiar with the idea of animal welfare, and probably most of us are animal welfareists. We have um, concerns about the use of animals. We think it's okay to use them in some fashion, um, and we feel that there ought to be some limits on how that might be used so that we don't do anything to harm the animal. Uh, but moving out in either direction from that is, uh, as you might ex imagine, a bell curve. And uh, at the one extreme is what Many people feel is exploitation of animals. This is typical of animal abuse. Uh, we have absolute dominion over animals. We can do whatever we want to them, and we don't really care about the consequences. Uh, and uh, things like dog fighting would be an example of that, bullfighting. And Michael Vick is learning about that now. Um, animal use is a, a more practical term, and we use, it was more common as a viewpoint uh, before the Industrial Revolution because we used animals uh, primarily to meet human needs, food, work, fiber, and so on. Um, and we've gradually moved closer and closer towards welfare as we've become, as, as people, we've moved further and further away from the farm. We've become more urbanized. We have less exposure to animals in a practical setting other than our companions. And we don't really know where the hamburger comes from or the, uh, um, the fish or the, the chicken or whatever else that we're eating. Uh, and then the two uh, other extremes are more modern in, in uh, evolution. 
Uh, one is animal rights, and that was, developed, was put forth by Peter Singer, who was an Australian philosopher uh, back in the 1970s in a book called Animal Liberation. And he talked about the concept that animals as entities have rights, just as humans have rights, and that we ought to be concerned about those rights and treat animals accordingly uh, to ensure that we don't um, infringe upon the rights of animals, just as we would hesitate to infringe upon the rights of humans. And that extended to an even further uh, viewpoint of animal liberation, which is uh, espoused by a number of uh, groups that feel very strongly that uh, all animal usage should be eliminated uh, in every way, shape, and form. And that their view of animal usage goes to the extreme that uh, owning a pet is really a form of slavery. And uh, that's inappropriate and all animals should have freedom of, to move about as they will. And as I said, most people tend to be kind of in the middle. It's a, really a bell curve and uh, all sorts of um, Surveys have been conducted to, to look at that, and it's pretty, it's pretty clear. Okay, well, looking at those uh, background concepts and then trying to get some numbers on this, and really, we like numbers, of course. Um, so there really isn't one agency in the federal government or worldwide uh, that looks at animal usage in any way, shape, or form. The, the, the best uh, study that was done was back really in 1990 in a uh, government monograph that was published. And um, so these, da these uh, data are rather out outdated. Uh, but the order of magnitude is what's important here. So at that point, we recognized that in terms of animal usage, uh, in the United States, we used about 6 billion animals for food. Uh, it's probably closer to about 7 billion now. Um, the vast majority of those animals that are slaughtered in uh, American slaughterhouses are uh, poultry. Uh, chickens really get the worst of it. Uh, but there are large numbers of uh, cattle, uh, pigs, um, sheep, and goats that are also uh, eaten. As far as uh, hunting, it's a, it's a major industry here in Michigan, of course. And um, it continues to be a major industry in a lot of parts of the United States. Uh, but we're only looking at about 2.6% uh, of animal usage being constituted by hunting. Um, I'll skip pounds for a moment. Uh, fur industry is, it takes a lot of uh, uh, flack because of the way that we, animals are raised in that industry and utilized. And again, it's, uh, it's a very small proportion, less than 0.2% uh, of the animals used are for fur. Um, the, the numbers on pounds, uh, these numbers have, are probably about half of that now. So uh, we're all familiar with pounds uh, in the United States where animals are, uh, unwanted animals are, are collected. And um, the, the dog and cat population in the United States is roughly 100 million dogs and cats in the United States. Uh, there are, for those of you who are cat people, you win. The, there are a little more cats than dogs. Um, but about... At that time, it was 27 million. Now we're looking at about 15 million dogs and cats are uh, killed in pounds each year in the United States because they're unwanted. So that's a fair, fair proportion of the animal population in the United States, animal dog and cat population. Uh, at that time, we're looking at about 25% then of you know, one-fourth of the animals in the United States are killed every year because they're unwanted, uh, dogs and cats. But now we're looking, uh, there's been extensive spay-neuter programs that have gone into effect. Uh, and um, we now know that a, about 15 million dogs and cats are still killed in the pounds. Uh, as far as research and teaching, these numbers are very uh, soft. Uh, at that time, they estimated 20 million uh, animals were used in research. Um, it's probably much larger than that uh, because of the way they collected the data um, in certain segments of the animal research industry, rats and mice are not counted, so those would be left off of the 20 million. But we're, we're looking at somewhere between 20 and 100 million animals uh, used in research a year versus the six or seven billion that are killed for food. So either way, it's still less than 1% of the animals used by humans are used for research. Okay, so um, 
is animal research of value to us? Uh, I think most scientists nowadays, not all, but most scientists would say yes. Uh, major medical advances uh, that we've seen in the last 100 years, uh, many, many, many of them have, been, uh, have involved the use of animals. Uh, and the list is endless, but a couple of obvious examples, organ transplants, uh, uh, this was something that was unheard of uh, uh, decades ago, but now it's a very common concept, and uh, it never would have gotten off the ground without the use of uh, animals. Similarly, uh, all the um, advances in infectious disease prevention, uh, development of vaccines, uh, all of them essentially have been uh, developed with the use of animals as models to ensure that those diseases no longer occur. I grew up in the area of polio, so it was a, a problem back then. It's essentially eliminated. We now know smallpox doesn't even exist in the, United, in the world anywhere except in a few laboratories in the, in the world. Um, so all of these diseases would not have been eliminated without the use of animals. But then that leads us to the, the ethical problem of uh, there is a cost to animal research, an ethical cost. Uh, research using animals has uh, saved human lives, reduced human suffering, increased scientific understanding, but it's clear that some animals are going to experience pain or distress, and virtually all the animals that are used in research are eventually euthanized. And for you, who become the future scientists of the world, the question for yourselves, and I can't answer it for you, but the question is, is that ethically acceptable to use an individual and to our society as a whole? Um, So most people, and again, lots of studies have been conducted to try to uh, identify societal feelings about this, but most, most people feel very strongly that animal, it is appropriate to use animals in research if we provide adequate protections to those animals, just as we would uh, protect humans uh, if we use them in research. So. Are, how many of you are currently uh, involved in laboratories where animal research is ongoing? Okay, fair number of you. So if you haven't figured it out yet, animal research is highly regulated and um, it gets more complex every year. There are, in the United States, and this is true of other countries as well, but we're only talking US at this point, uh, these are the major laws and standards that are currently in effect. The, uh, there is a general document, oops, long button, a general uh, set of principles that have been published. This, was, this came about a number of years ago. These are very simple statements that um, things like if you talk about pain, um, it's presumed that if it's painful in a human, it's painful in an animal. Uh, simple statements along the lines of animals must be provided with the appropriate food, water, bedding, care, uh, that, they, that is appropriate for their species. The Animal Welfare Act was a law that was uh, enacted initially back in the 1960s uh, as a result of some, uh, the inappropriate use of dogs in research back then. And it was a, uh, you all are too young to remember Life Magazine as it was, but there was a, a major uh, photojournalism um, uh, expose about the use of dogs in, in biomedical research back in the 60s. And uh, it was very shocking to see those pictures, and many of them are still available out on the web. But the end result was that Congress passed uh, an Animal Welfare Act, which has been um, modified a number of times since then, that very, strict, uh, very clearly defines the use of animals in research, how they should be cared for, what the standards are for housing, feeding, watering, and so on. Um, the peculiarity of, the, of this law is that it defines what an animal is, and uh, animal only applies to warm-blooded animals, so fish and frogs are excluded, uh, and birds, uh, uh, excuse me, before I go on. So it only applies to warm-blooded animals, and it only applies to certain warm-blooded animals. Um, so chickens or birds are excluded, and in addition, rats and mice are excluded from the Federal Animal Welfare Act. So it really only covers the, the larger species and a few rodent species. So we would think of dogs, cats, primates, but also uh, rabbits, uh, guinea pigs, and hamsters. But rats and mice are not included in the federal law. Um, 
A number of years ago, uh, again back in the 60s when a lot of this activity began, the uh, uh, federal government had a, a policy back then called the PHS Policy on Humane Care and Use of Laboratory Animals. Uh, it sort of went unchanged for many, many years and uh, in the 80s went, underwent a dramatic transformation uh, by the Public Health Service, and that includes NIH, of course, and uh, very clearly stated what the government's policy was regarding the use of animals in biomedical research funded by the Public Health Service. So uh, it essentially is a contract, and it says, if you accept the money that we give you to do research, you will follow the, these rules that we have set aside on animal research. If you don't want to follow those rules, we won't give you the money. Another document, uh, and this is a standards document, is the Guide for the Care and Use of Laboratory Animals. Uh, this is the Bible of animal welfare and animal research. Uh, it was actually developed first here at the University of Michigan, uh, again back in the 60s by um, uh, a group of individuals that included my mentor, Ben Cohen, who was the director of ULAM at that time. Uh, but the Guide uh, for the Care and Use of Laboratory Animals is now regarded as the um, premier standards document for uh, animal care and use in research. It's not only accepted in the United States, it's widely accepted throughout the world as a general standard of how you approach animal research. <clears throat> and as you might imagine, it's somewhat of a living document and gets re revised every number of years uh, and new standards are added to that, uh, that uh, document. And then finally, there's an accreditation program that was started. Um, it's an organization called the Association for Assessment of Accreditation of Laboratory Animal Care. It's a group, it's a nonprofit um, private organization that evaluates member organizations for their compliance to all of the above standards. So they will come in here, for example, we're about to get our site visit in the first quarter of next year, and they'll evaluate uh, our animal care and use program with reference to the guide, the PHS policy, the Animal Welfare Act, and so on. Um, since it's a private organization, their results are uh, not subject to Freedom of Informa Information Act uh, requests, and um, it's very analogous for those of you who have a medical background to the Joint Commission on Hospital and Healthcare or, uh, Accreditation and other similar organizations where it's a self-regulating industry. Okay, in addition, there's something, if you're involved in animal research, you should be familiar with um, the three R's. Uh, these were put forth by a couple of British scientists, Russell and Birch, back in 1959. And they've, uh, uh, it, they've survived the test of time. Um, they, it, was a, it was a government commission that they worked on that was supposed to identify issues of importance in, uh, in biomedical research using animals in uh, the United Kingdom at the time. And they came up with the concept of the three R's that they proposed that any good scientist um, should be committed to the three R's with regard to animal research. And it's simply, uh, over time, you should be reducing the number of animals that you use in research, um, refining the experiments that you carry out such that animal numbers are reduced, uh, animal usage is reduced, and ultimately replacing uh, animals with non-animal uh, models and techniques. And if you think about the way research is conducted now, that's still rather true. Uh, a good scientist is going to pick the best model that's available, whether it involves an animal or not. So ultimately, many models move from the animal uh, to the organ or cellular level uh, and sometimes back to the animal again, but certainly uh, models evolve over time. Uh, and similarly, as you get better at the techniques you're involved in, in the research you're conducting, you're refining what you're doing, you eventually end up using fewer and fewer animals because of the way you're conducting your research. Okay, so I mentioned all of these standards that are um, available or, and govern the way we use animals um, without going into great detail because it's uh, numbingly boring. Um, the specific areas that are regulated in all of these different kinds of standards and include a whole host of uh, subject areas, including the physical plant, the ventilation systems, um, the husbandry care of the animals, meaning the food, the water, the sanitation, how often should we clean the cages. Um, 
the kind of housing animals uh, that we use for animals, the enrichment that we provide. Uh, certain species have to be provided with enrichment by law. Certain species have to be provided with exercise, like dogs, for example, in, specific in the Animal Welfare Act. Uh, mechanisms for procurement and transportation of animals around the United States. Um, provisions for veterinary medical care for animals. Um, surgery standards. Uh, avoidance and alleviation of discomfort, distress, and pain, meaning the use of anesthesia and analgesia in animals, euthanasia methods that are uh, approved or disapproved, uh, personnel qualifications and training. This becomes very important nowadays, and there's a lot of emphasis on this, that we, uh, people who conduct animal research should be adequately trained to do the work that they're proposing to do. Uh, occupational health and safety, there are risks to you working with animals. There are allergies. Allergy is probably the number one risk of working with animals, uh, but there are others as well. And the other, one of the most important changes that occurred, and many of these changes occurred back in 1985 when the major uh, um, overhaul of the Public Health Service Policy and the Animal Welfare Act uh, occurred, was the establishment of institutional animal care and use committees. And these committees are a mechanism of local control at each institution for managing the use of animals in research. And it has completely changed the landscape for animal research since that time. Um, the, in the laws and the standards, the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committees uh, have a variety of responsibilities. These committees are comprised of scientists, non-scientists, veterinarians, public members. Um, they're charged with reviewing all use of animals in research, and all should be underlined. Uh, they're responsible for reviewing the animal care and use program at least once every six months, so that would include all of the st uh, standards, the uh, guidelines that are appropriate for that particular institution. They inspect every animal care and use facility on campus at least once every six months. Uh, for us, that's a daunting task. It takes us about two months to inspect all of our facilities because we have so many. Uh, we have upwards of, a, of about 200,000 square feet of animal space, over 700 rooms that are associated with animal care and use on campus. So it, it's very extensive. Uh, and they report on their evaluations of the animal care and use program and the facilities to an individual identified in the laws and standards as the institutional official. We like to call that person the go-to-jail guy. Um, that's the vice, here it's the vice president for research, but that could be someone else at different institutions. Okay. Now, if you haven't been told this by your mentors, uh, please memorize this. All procedures, no matter how minor, must be approved by the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee in advance of your doing them. Doesn't matter how trivial you think it is, you may have approval to anesthetize an animal with ketamine and xylazine, and you decide you want to use isoflurane. You have to get approval to make that change in the anesthetic before you actually do it. Most people don't understand that the way these laws and regulations are set up, um, it's very restrictive on the institution, on the university. Uh, if you move forward in a change of what you've been approved to do by the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, Without getting approval, you are essentially in violation. You are in non-compliance with federal laws and standards. And the Animal Care Committee is, their hands are tied. In many cases, they will have to report this uh, not only to university officials, but potentially, if your research is funded by NIH, to the NIH itself. It's a very serious matter. Um, and. Uh, it's a common issue that we encounter, that the, the Animal Care Committee encounters, that people said, well, I guess I didn't realize that I had to ask for permission to make that change. Uh, but the bottom line is every procedure that's conducted on animals must be reviewed by the Animal Care and Use Committee in advance of it being performed. Okay, so um, some of you may have had the experience of having to fill out our application to use animals in uh, research and instruction at the university. Uh, we've gone to an online system. Every institution in the country uh, where you might conduct research after you leave here is going to have their counterpart of the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. Ours is called the University Committee on Use and Care of Animals. We actually had an IACUC long before they were ever required by the federal government. 
So we named it the way we wanted to name it, and everybody else came along and called it Iacook later on. Uh, but our Yakuka is, uh, um, has a long history in doing this. Um, as I said, we've moved to a, an online application system. It's uh, a bit of a daunting task uh, at this stage. We're working out some of the, the bugs in the system and trying to improve the speed of review. But the, uh, any organization or institution that you go to is going to have a comparable application system in place. Um, and similar topic areas are going to be covered uh, in, in their application. Things like the basic project description, uh, why is this important? Why do you have to use animals? Why do you have to use this species of animals? Why do you have to use this number of animals? Um, a basic description of the actual procedures you're going to conduct, uh, whether they be surgical procedures, injections, uh, blood withdrawal, tumor injection, um, any number of procedures. Whatever you do to an animal must be described in the protocol reviewed and approved by the Animal Care and Use Committee. Uh, and uh, the, the list goes on. Uh, we added a question many years ago when we first developed the, our first application of uh, the, the adverse consequences to the animal. If you do what you say you're going to do, what's the animal going to experience? Um, are they going to get ill? Um, are they going to die as a result of it? Uh, we want to know what the consequences are to the animals. Uh, because that helps judge the uh, seriousness of the research being conducted. Um, other areas, uh, the personnel working with the animals, their training and experience increasingly. We see a trend nationally towards emphasis on training and experience and providing more and more training in-house to investigators conducting research and their, uh, their personnel. Um, and uh, identifying the agency or individual that's reviewed the proposal for scientific merit. We don't explicitly review, the committee doesn't explicitly review for scientific merit, although they have the authority to do so. So we pretty much say if it's been reviewed by a funding agency like NIH through the peer review mechanism, that's adequate uh, evidence of scientific merit. Um, okay, so there, are a number of hot button issues that you need to be aware of um, that institutional animal care and use committees have to deal with. And we see these here, we see these trends nationally, um, and uh, we're still at a stage where these are not highly regulated by the federal government, but there's potential for the government to get involved and say that there are specific standards that you have to address when conducting these kinds of research. A lot of this, uh, if you're engaged in pain research, for example, many of the professional societies develop their own set of, of standards, their own code of conduct regarding uh, research on pain in animals. Uh, many of the societies that work in these areas have developed their own standards. So in terms of pain research, it's clear that the standards that we in general have to deal with uh, require that pain has to be relieved. Um, if you induce pain in an animal, it's supposed to be uh, eliminated. But obviously, to study pain and its treatment, you have to induce it. So uh, there are a number of uh, uh, well-established paradigms for studying pain in animals. How do we deal with those? The Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee works with investigators to try to uh, set standards for the university. Again, it's local control of what we're comfortable with, what types of research, what types of paradigms are useful and acceptable here, things like there's one called the tail flick assay. Uh, so if you have an animal that's uh, been given an analgesic agent, um, the time that it takes for it to remove its tail from either a laser beam or uh, a, warm, a warm water uh, that you place the tail into, any number of ways of doing it, you're looking at a, a, a lag time. So if the analgesic works, the tail stays in the hot beam longer, so to speak. Um, hot plate is exactly what it sounds like. Um, this is an older test. It's been replaced pretty much by the tail flick, but uh, you had a, a warming plate. Uh, it wasn't hot enough to burn the animal, but you're looking at the lag time for the animal to jump off the plate because it feels the pain. Um, uh, abdominal pain assays are also commonly used. This is a very standardized paradigm. Um, it used to be called the writhing test. I think they didn't like that 
terminology very well. So they went to uh, abdominal pain tests. And again, it, it, the pain receptors in the abdominal cavity are very different than those on the surface of the skin. Um, so uh, uh, using it for a different, measuring different kinds of pain becomes important. But again, the, what's important here is that at the, at the University of Michigan, when pain researchers here propose these kinds of experiments, the committee has to work with the investigator to determine what's acceptable and what we're comfortable with here at the university. Uh, stress research is another hot button area that we've uh, dealt with both here and, and nationally. These are any kind of study on the physiology of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis um, and any m number of methods to treat stress. So in these kinds of experiments, stress is specifically induced in the animal, again, using very standardized paradigms, and then uh, either treatments for stress or interventions that might prevent stress are, are evaluated. The standard methodologies are things like mild electric shock, uh, cold exposure, and this is usually for like 24 hours, um, aggressive encounter with a dominant animal. Uh, we learned about that paradigm a few years ago. We had never encountered it before, but it was a very interesting one where if you have a dominant and a, an aggressive, these are typically done with rats, um, you put the two animals together in, in a a neutral area, the dominant animal will not attack, but aggress towards the other animal, and the submissive behavior is evaluated. So then you can use this standard paradigm to evaluate uh, stress on the submissive animal based on how long it takes for them to assume a submissive posture. Very rarely do the, does the aggressive animal actually physically attack a, a uh, submissive animal. Uh, it, in nature, you know, uh, between conspecifics in the same species, uh, oftentimes aggression is um, mediated in such a way that you don't want to kill your, your, uh, your conspecific. You want to just intimidate them enough that they will leave you alone or stay out of your territory. So uh, it's a very standardized uh, encounter that, that's utilized, and we've dealt with these kinds of problems here at the university. How do we address this? What's acceptable uh, for use here? Uh, electric shock may sound terrible, but the reality is we tell the investigators uh, that they have to touch the same grid as the animals. <laughs> uh, and the reality is, is the level of, of shock that's provided to the animal is extremely low. Uh, and there's essentially no pain associated with it, just discomfort. So the animal quickly uh, it tries to escape from the shock, and that's the mechanism that's utilized. But it sounds worse than it actually is. Um, and another uh, hot button area that we deal with quite a bit are studies that uh, result in an end stage illness for the animal, some se severe debilitation. Um, in most research, that's conducted, and this will be true for almost all of you in the audience, the types of experiments conducted on animals really don't result in the animal experience, experiencing severe clinical disease. Even tumor growth experiments, a tumor's administered, we're waiting for it to grow from one millimeter to six millimeters. That's the end of the experiment. Um, so typically, in most types of research, animals don't experience severe uh, illness. But in a few types of research, that, that is a valid endpoint for the research being conducted. So we have to deal then with um, ways to manage that debilitation and illness in such a way that the research can still go forward, and at the same time, the animal doesn't suffer unnecessarily as a result of it. So examples would be things, as I mentioned, tumor studies, but typically tumor studies where you're looking for the, the where the endpoint is uh, not just the size of the tumor, but the survival of the animal. So where you're using a particular treatment modality and your endpoint really is how many in my treatment group survive the cancer. Um, sepsis is another uh, very important area in research. It's a serious medical problem and a number of studies look at ways of uh, mediating sepsis, interfering with sepsis, preventing sepsis, or um, better treatments for it. In this case, there is a standard paradigm for producing sepsis in an animal, um, but these animals clearly get sick. The goal then is not to allow the animal to die spontaneously, but to intervene at an earlier time point where you still get the data you're interested in, but the animal doesn't necessarily have to die uh, 
in a, an agonal condition. You're intervening and euthanizing the animal actively at a much earlier time point. Uh, burn studies, serious problem in, metal, in medicine. Uh, we have to have a model system for studying burns in animals, and uh, there are a variety of, of standard methods that have been developed for burning small areas of skin rather than the whole animal or large areas so that you can study the biological mechanisms, the basic mechanisms involved in burn and prevention uh, and uh, treatment for burn. Hybridoma production, another area, these are hybridomas or monoclonal antibodies that are used, uh, they're used in humans as well for therapy, but they're a very valuable research tool that's utilized. We have to have guidelines for how to produce that. That is one area where the federal government has stepped in and established certain guidelines on hybridoma production in mice. And then finally, infectious diseases. We still have a, a variety of infectious diseases that have to be addressed. Many of these, in order to develop appropriate therapies or, or preventive mechanisms, have to be addressed in such a way that the animal has to get the disease. Uh, the idea then is to intervene at an earlier time point before the, actual, the animal actually dies as a result of the infection. OK, um, so most IA cooks around the country, what they do is they uh, uh, adopt a variety of approaches to uh, deal with these kinds of difficult issues that they have to manage at their ins home institution. Um, a few places will adopt outright prohibition of conducting experiments of a particular type. And I have seen this at other institutions around the country where they say, you can't do that kind of research here. If you want to do that, you have to go someplace else. That's a pretty restrictive approach to medical research, and I don't particularly agree with it. Uh, most institutions are going to tackle these kinds of uh, difficult issues using a variety of guidelines. They're going to put a lot of training in, in place for the in individuals involved in those type of uh, difficult research areas. And they're going to implement a mechanism for post-approval monitoring. We'll approve you to do the work, but we're going to come back and check on you uh, repeatedly to make sure that things are going appropriately, that the animals are not suffering, that you're getting your results, but the animals are being cared for appropriately. <clears throat> okay, um, so moving on, there are a few things that uh, you as scientists uh, are going to have to deal with in the future. Um, these are kind of emerging areas uh, ethical, in ethical issues in animal research. Um, and th the, um, the ethics of these are, not, are still a little fuzzy around the edges, uh, and people have some difficulty with these. And, our society as a whole still has some problems with them. Uh, genetic engineering, obviously, it's uh, well established in biomedical research as a methodology. Uh, it's used a lot primarily in mice, but we see it now in a whole variety of other species as well. Um, we have a, uh, uh, effective mechanisms for, for uh, inducing genetic modifications in animals. But the reality is these are very, very crude technologies. Um, going back not that long ago when they first cloned Dolly, the sheep. Most people don't realize that Dolly, I think, was number, sheep number 274. Um, so they lost a lot of animals before they actually had one survive the cloning process. So there's a tremendous amount of wastage that goes on in um, uh, conducting these types of experiments in either knockouts and transgenics or in cloning. Um, they tend, this tends to be contrary to the three R's because of the animal wastage. We're not refining our technology as fast as we ought to. Um, so far, the public is mute on the use of rodents uh, in terms of this type of technology, but um, they're a bit fearful of some of the practical applications of genetic technologies. Uh, we think about agricultural applications. We have, the, I mean, these are systems that are ongoing now, but there are mechanisms for um, agricultural application of genetic technology so we can improve uh, uh, the type of animals that we're using, either larger milk production in cattle, uh, leaner uh, pork loins, uh, whatever your interest is. There are a variety of technologies that are available, but people don't necessarily want to eat those animals. They're a little uncomfortable with uh, eating a genetically modified animal. Uh, in addition, there's a, a technology that's uh, available for farming with the pH, which is to um, utilize the animal as a biological uh, uh, incubator to produce a product. So we can produce um, insulin, human insulin, in cattle or goats. 
Uh, we can produce a whole variety of hormones or biological products by genetically modifying animals. And it's actually cheaper to produce insulin from, uh, in cattle and uh, extract it from the milk than it is to do it in, in uh, E. coli, for example. So, uh, but again, people are a little uncomfortable with these technologies that are not quite certain whether we should be moving forward with these. Um, another one is uh, xenotransplantation. And this overlaps a little bit with genetic technologies, but it's a very aggressive area of research uh, in, some as in some areas of the United States right now. Um, so xenotransplantation is simply the transplantation of an organ from an animal to a human. Uh, the numbers are uh, really straightforward. I haven't updated these in a while, but basically you've got about 83,000, I think it's closer to 100,000 now, people that qualify for organ transplants in the United States. Um, and believe it or not, there are less than 15,000 donors in the United States uh, for organs. Um, so you've got about 100,000 people, 25,000 organ transplants are being performed, and you've only got uh, less than 15,000 donors. So there are a lot of people that are going on without organs and dying, of course. So we need bridging technologies or replacement technologies for organ transplantation. Xenotransplantation is one of those uh, replacement or bridging technologies that people are working very aggressively on. The idea is to be able to take an organ from an animal, put it into a human, and not bother with going back to a human, if ideally you could do that. Um, the, the genetic side of that technology is to take animals, uh, genetically modify those animals, and such that the organs are not rejected by humans. You, you humanize those animals in such a way that they're, uh, you're, you're overcoming the MHC system. Um, the, the type species that's used primarily for uh, xenotransplantation is the pig. And um, there are active research programs that are humanizing pigs so that we can transplant primarily kidneys is the first one that they're working on uh, into humans and those will not be rejected. The problem we get with this are the, in terms of the ethical side of things, and we haven't quite hit this yet, but as you imagine, what we're doing here is um, uh, growing a pig specifically for production of an organ and throwing the rest away. So there's a fair amount of wastage that's involved in that. Um, and uh, there's concerns about the animal well-being. Why are we doing this sort of thing? Uh, maybe we should just work harder on getting more people to become organ donors. Um, I can imagine, you know, looking 30 years into the future, which I like to do a lot, and uh, we're going to have an organ farm out at Brighton, I think, and uh, we're going to be growing pigs there for transplantation of organs into people at, at University Hospital. Um, that, that, I think the public is going to be a little bit concerned about that uh, when we get into that level of technology, but it, it is a, a significant problem. Um, we still haven't worked out this technology. It's a little cumbersome. It's still, again, fuzzy around the edges. The, 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 there are two camps in the xenotransplantation world. One camp wanted to use uh, baboons, and the other camp wanted to use pigs. Uh, as they worked through some of the baboon problems, they discovered that baboons have a whole bunch of retroviruses that people didn't know about, and they started, they started worrying about transplanting these baboon organs into people, and all sorts of new diseases coming about because of the trans, uh, transplantation of retroviruses. As it turns out, pigs have a whole bunch of retroviruses too that we didn't know about that we're beginning to discover. And um, uh, a few people have received uh, some of those organs and we're watching them pretty closely to see if uh, anything develops as a result of it. But um, this hasn't quite hit the stage of mass marketing, um, but I think uh, in the next 20 years, we'll probably see this uh, develop. Okay, so in the last two minutes, um, uh, you know, again, I, I'll be glad to answer any questions anybody has, but I thought I, now that you know the background, I thought I'd give you a few uh, snapshots of what life is like in my world at the, at the University of Michigan. Um, these are some of the census data for uh, animal use at the university. Um, if you haven't figured it out yet by being in some of the animal facilities, animal research is big business. Um, and it involves a lot of animals, and uh, we're just one place in the, uh, the world that does this. Um, so 
simply put, uh, this is uh, the, the yellow column is daily census. In other words, if you went through any, if you went through the university and counted noses, these are the number of animals you'd find associated with those noses. Um, the animal use is strictly total number counted by the university in the course of one year. Um, and without, I mean, we use a whole bunch of different species, frogs, birds, cats, chickens, dogs, ferrets, guinea pigs, mice, monkey pigs, so on and so forth. Um, but uh, if you focus in on mouse, for example, uh, back in 1990, um, we only had 13,000 mice on campus. Our daily population in 05 was 108,000. We're uh, rapidly approaching 150,000 mice, daily animal population. Um, in terms of animal use, the uh, same kinds of uh, order of magnitude. We only had about 35,000 mice used in 1990. 15 years later, we saw about 300,000 mice used. We're rapidly approaching a half a million a year. Um, in terms of some of the, the statistics, university has about 180,000 square feet of animal facility space. Um, we're at about 36 different buildings on campus have animals in them. Uh, animal housing rooms around seven, seven to 800. Uh, in ULAM, which is my world, is about 135 employees. When I came here in 1972, I think we had about 40 employees. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, big business is an issue here. Um, the university has 312, uh, it's actually more now, this was 05, uh, awards from external sponsors, grants from NIH and foundations and so on. So about 300 grants that involve the use of animals. Those grants are bringing in upwards of $200 million worth of research to the university. That's a fair dollar amount. We have about um, 500 investigators on campus as a whole, that are approved to use animals in research, and those investigators uh, have roughly a thousand approved protocols on file. So it's a pretty substantial system that we have to deal with. Uh, we estimate that there are about 4,000 people on campus that touch animals in the course of doing research. That includes you, technicians, undergraduate students, and well, investigators never touch the animals anymore, but. Um, Certainly a large number of people, and as I mentioned earlier, the emphasis is more and more on um, training and ensuring that those people have the adequate training and uh, uh, experience to conduct the research. You're looking at training a large number of people every year. We train ULAM and Yukuka both train about 2,000 people annually. <clears throat> um, there's, as I said, about 1,000 protocols on file. The Yukuka office processes about 300 applications a year, new applications as the old ones expire, and we're looking at about 1,200, 11 to 1,200 modifications. Remember I told you, if you want to change anesthetics, it goes into this category. So it's about 1,200 applications have to be processed annually just to deal with changes in the protocol. I think that was my last slide. Yes. So uh, that gives you some background on animal research, both in the United States as well as the university. Uh, kind of scopes it out for you. Um, a lot of this falls on you, the student in the laboratories conducting your research. And um, you have to have a responsibility both to the university as well as to the animals in the type of work you're conducting. Um, this is a, a very uh, important subject area for the American population. The public is very concerned about animal research and how it's conducted in the United States. And the last thing we want is for more regulation, although it's almost inevitable, but we want to make sure that uh, we do this appropriately so that the federal government doesn't step in uh, heavy-handedly in controlling the way research is conducted in the United States. Any questions? Okay, thank you for attending and I appreciate it. Thanks. Do they have another lecture after this? Or, yep, okay, all right. I guess you have a couple minutes break. <laughs>